Good morning. I am a student of a bunch of, um, of, of the black church and a child of a bunch of teachers. So uh, that's the worst combination. So uh, I need you to talk back to me. Good morning. I like trees. I enjoy long walks in the park or along the canopy trail by my house in Atlanta. Trees offer, trees give. They are soothing for the body, the soul, and the spirit. As a native Texan, I appreciate their shade in the summertime and the way that they hide and provide cover from the elements of the rain and the sun. Trees also have a long history of giving white people what they need. Newton's physics, Washington's apples, Lincoln's logs. <laughs> the porch around the big house and the chair rocking on it back and forth, back and forth, as master's wife oversaw her property. That same porch where probably right now, on this very Saturday, 150 years later, some white couple is joining in holy matrimony, willfully ignorant of the blood, sweat, and tears of my ancestors who cut down trees and laid those beams, but were unworthy to even be buried in caskets made from them. My ancestors, who all too quickly became a strange fruit for white consumption, like Newton's apples and Washington's cherries. I want to talk today about lost voices, about stolen happiness. While I center on an excavation of Shakespeare's play Othello, I branch out to a critique of the American cultural prerogatives that continually and persistently silence, by way of appropriation, black voices, black art, black emotion. I am largely interested in the ways that whiteness co-ops the beauty of blackness at the expense of black people. And I see early modern literature as just one site of this theft. I also turn to our own um, practices in the academy of citation, of use, abuse, and attribution when it comes to black, indigenous, and people of color, who, as Ayanna Thompson truthfully told us yesterday, have always been here. Wesley Morris has an essay about the continual theft of black music, an American tradition in a recent New York Times Magazine issue called 1619, a timely anthology of essays collected around a conversation convened by Nicole Hannah-Jones, featuring important critical work about the intertwined legacies and histories of race and democracy in the United States. Though if someone wanted to have a conversation about race in 1619, they would have done well to make a pit stop at Race Before Race for a soundbite or 10. In his essay, Morris writes, quote, blackness was on the move before my ancestors were legally free to be. It was on the move before my ancestors even knew what they had. He, it was on the move because white people were moving it. He goes on, loving black culture has never meant loving black people too. Loving black culture risks losing, loving the life out of it. As I sat down to write this talk, I toyed around with terms related to apropos of this year's conference theme of appropriations. Some of these terms came up yesterday in the series of brilliant lectures offered by my esteemed colleagues. While I consider the violence that the systems of whiteness, not just in America, but in pre-modern literatures sometimes happily enact upon communities of color, words like borrow, remix, adapt, plagiarize, ventriloquize, gentrify, assimilate, incorporate, all circulate in my head. But I ended up with just one, theft. Barbary's blues and the theft of happiness attends the song of what I see as a kind of early modern blues woman and its afterlives, revisions, recitations, and replacements. I read the so-called Willow Song I read the so-called Willow Song in the way that scholars of later periods, like Ralph Ellison, interpret the blues. For Ellison, 
The blues is an impulse to keep the painful details and episodes of a brutal experience alive in one's aching consciousness, to finger its jagged grain and to transcend it, not by the consolation of philosophy, but by squeezing from it a near tragic, near comic lyricism. The Willow Song is like an impulse, I suggest, that poetically preserves the painful details of Barbary's story, yet imagines a world that transcends the oppression and marginalization she perhaps experienced in the Brabantio household. It creatively safeguards a significant event in Barbary's life that humanizes her beyond enslavement and servitude and resists dominant ways of figuring blackness as uncivilized, promiscuous, or idle in early modern Europe. There is a long tradition of white people appropriating, destroying, or stealing black art and ideas for their own emotional comfort to make themselves feel more validated and more human. Perhaps whiteness as a system operates sadistically, that is, in deriving meaning from black pain, curating a sense of relevance from black erasure, cultivating a kind of happiness from black sorrow. Couched in the verb appropriate, are the ideas of ownership, possession, property, and some temporal distinction between what was yours and what is now mine. It is putting an old thing to use in a new context, making something work for different purposes. A good modernist might claim to make it new, for example, the it being medieval and early modern texts and those from non-European context rendered available for examination and the new being the call to cultivate them for modernist aesthetic tastes, as if the old needed to be remade, recast, represented, and clarified. But it's not inherently bad. The late Christie Desmond writes that the word appropriation implies exchange, um, either the theft or appropriation of something valuable or a gift, end quote. Thus appropriation happens by intention, but never by accident. It is always active, never passive. You don't happen to appropriate. Appropriation happens to you. Shakespeare is a chief appropriator, an expert in the art of theft and shady attribution. <laughs> the basis of the plot for Othello was lifted from Cynthia's earlier Italian prose romance and melded to fit his then present English circumstances. The song in question and the character of Barbary were created, re-engineered, and are implanted precisely to provide deeper motivations for Desdemona's emotional reactions to the dramatic violence in the play. When she recalls the image of Barbary as her mother's maid, Shakespeare's Barbary was always meant to serve Othello's Desdemona. Appearing only in the 1623 folio text, Barbary's song, appearing first in the 1623 folio text, Barbary's song is usurped by a white Venetian woman, a woman who happens to be a member of the household that contracted Barbary's labor and the inheritor of the power cultivated by her family's participation in the exploitation of black lives. Yes, Barbary does cite, uh, Desdemona does cite Barbary, but only for her mother's maid to be relegated as a footnote in her own sad love song. Just because she may have been, uh, as Peter Sellers thoughtfully claims, raised by a black woman, that doesn't mean that Brabantio's daughter has fully accepted or engaged with, in the imagined world of the play, black culture. Her proximity to black people does not guarantee her access to blackness. As she consumes black stories, marries a black man, and obtains, then loses, the black handkerchief, Desdemona remains on the outside, passively looking in at the black culture she consumes so voraciously that she fetishizes. Just like the handkerchief moves because of white hands in the play, who exchange it through questionable means, the Willow Song moves long after its passing of its curator and gains a different significance through white hands. While she may indeed uh, name Marbury, the practice of saying her name as one current presidential candidate has promised to do, is but one step in what could otherwise be a much deeper commitment to transformative social and racial justice. The question we must all ask ourselves is, what are we going to do to honor the memories of those who've gone before us, especially those who've been stolen away in the night or in broad daylight?
like Sandra Bland, Rakia Boyd, Malaysia Booker, Tatiana Jefferson. How do we press on when we ourselves have been complicit, even indirectly, in the silencing of black voices? Is it possible to both say her name and make it new as a just and ethical practice of appropriation? Yes, hashtag cite black women, but engage with their work and do it in the text too. And when you do, ask yourself if you're doing it to boost others and highlight those voices who might otherwise get lost in Google's algorithm, or are you doing it to make yourself feel better, to check off your I read my black book for the year box <laughs> and move on with your celebrated scholarly life? So you read the race before race tweets, but what will you do when the conference is over? Back to the text. It is ironic to say her name in this case because we don't really know Barbary's name. We can only access her through Desdemona and really through Shakespeare's imagination of a woman whose given name represents anything from a specific region to an entire continent. The gloss of her name in the recently revised art and edition suggests that the name was a constant one, a common one for the time. But I like to think of her in the same way that we think of characters like Zanchi in Webster's The White Devil or Xanthia in Marston's The Wonder of Women. Xanthia, who features as Sophonisba's maid, is betrayed and arrested by her mistress's guards. Joyce MacDonald argues that in this systematic removal, both the mistress and the villain Syphax, ste quote, step out of their dramatic antagonism long enough to agree on the necessity for Xanthia's punishment, unquote. Her black skin is criminalized in order to emphasize the figurative morality of Sophonisba's whiteness, which itself seems to be Marston's solution for the play's misogyny. Unlike with Marston's and Webster's characters, however, Shakespeare's Barbary is never truly able to employ her own voice and subjectivity beyond what we can conjure from the details that Desdemona provides. Kim Hall suggests that the name Barbary draws on, quote, an early modern sense of Africa as a place not only of wonder and magic, but also of disorder and unruly sexuality, unquote. Located in Barbary in Northern Africa uh, was a place of a trade, a perceived safe zone for English travelers and merchants to conduct business. Like Cyprus in the play functions to sustain the myth of Venice, the imaginary space of Barbary exist in the early modern imagination to serve English interest and to sustain English fantasies of security and sovereignty. Constructed as a safe place for English refuge, piracy, and play, Barbary is not only unruly, but functions as an opportunity for English exploitation and mastery. Barbary is imagined as a safe space for white fragility to be coddled and for white mediocrity to flourish. Shout out to Coretha Mitchell for the wonderful article on that subject. The title of my talk today comes from a line in Act 4, Scene 3 of the play Othello, where Desdemona recollects the sonic memory of Barbary. While I attempt to read the song through Barbary, Shakespeare's audience would have likely heard the influence of English folk traditions more than any foreign associations. Moreover, some audiences would have never even heard or read the lyrics to the song as a 1622 quarto omits the piece entirely. Jumping from Desdemona's preface about Barbary all the way to her insistence that Amelia leave the bedroom. Nevertheless, in the folio text, she recalls Barbary's life through this song of Willow. I am interested in what Desdemona says and what she doesn't say about the woman on whom she remembers eavesdropping. I say eavesdropping, although you could say overheard, but I use the former intentionally because according to Desdemona, Barbary's only formal or legitimated relationship was with her unnamed and absentee mother. Thus, while tending to Desdemona was very likely a part of Barbary's role in the household, the text we are given suggests that whatever role Barbary played in young Desdemona's life was unofficial or unwarranted. You don't, after all, eavesdrop on something you were supposed to hear. Nevertheless, Desdemona hears this song over and over again, the song that Barbary supposedly used as a sleep aid, a coping mechanism for comfort amidst what some might see as a welcoming atmosphere, but might just as well be a suffocating environment of white privilege. 
Desdemona's fear of impending death and her bewilderment at her husband's behavior leads her back to the image of Barbary in the first place, an image that reminds her of the song, a piece of art that then gives her conference during, comfort during her own instability. The song provides the glue to hold together the fissures in fragile white subjectivity. She takes it from Barbary's cold dead hands and uses it to promote her own emotional ambition to feel whole. But of course, uh, she can't even remember and recite the song properly. The glue fails to give her the peace she requires and instead makes her even more anxious and frustrated. Though called on to serve her mistress even in death, Barbary fails in her continued role to manufacture and sustain Desdemona's happiness. Now, if I could have a little creative license, I would like to consider now how uh, Desdemona revives Barbary and Barbary, Barbary recreates Desdemona, though not by choice. And furthermore, uh, crafts Shakespeare's play itself, a play, uh, on, uh, a play on words uh, from what Sujata Iyengar calls, uh, quote, woman-crafted Shakespeare's, making it unique from its pro progenitors. How does Barbary's song curate a blues narrative about oppression, duty, and liberation that Desdemona misreads and transforms into a pop anthem for white feminine solidarity? <laughs> for Angela Davis, blues women like Bessie Smith, Ma Rainey, and I would also like to add Willie Mae Thornton, whose hound dog made Elvis a star, Imagine the kind of love and desire in their blues lyrics that were incompatible with dominant ideologies that centered white, male, heteronormative relationships. Part of the resistance of the blues, sung by women, is its audacity to express emancipation, a kind of black eudaimonic happiness through sexuality. As such, these songs offered a critique of the anti-black systems that sought to discipline black sexuality and romance while expressing a hope for a future that persisted in its liberation from those systems. While Desdemona only knew Barbary as her mother's maid, perhaps in a role like Emilia, Barbary had another life. And this song of Willow uh, preserves and perseveres as her quote, happy object, which as Sarah Ahmed explains, helps to safeguard a past under the threat of erasure. To read between the lines presented, we see that she was in love. And this love, uh, we see that she was in love. And this love, I believe, transcended her servitude because black love knows no bounds. The text suggests that Barbara was in love with a man who could not love her back and who, perhaps of this affair, was, quote, proved mad. The syntax is opaque. Quote, she was in love, and he she loved proved mad and did forsake her. It points to some obstacle standing in the way of their exercise of sexuality, the desire having been proven mad by some legal, medical, or political authority. As the story goes, the man for some reason abandoned her, thereby interrupting one form of melancholy, love, with a diagnosis of another, madness. As such, Desdemona's recounting presents a complex picture of the possibility of black love as an inherently melancholic and damaging, damagingly irrational phenomenon. Barbary's melancholic love is thus marked as madness and threatens the social order of the household. But it's useful to Desdemona. Though Barbary reminds Desdemona of death and of love becoming madness, the Willow Song gives her a few more meaningful moments of life. Blues is about finding meaning in meaningless situations. It is a rejection of minstrelsy and a simple format that allows for infinite variation. Playing the blues was a way of getting rid of the blues, stomping it away. As the blues itself was notable for its capacity for turning hopelessness into hope or for revealing the hope within a hopeless situation, it is possible that Desdemona hears and desires this for herself and takes the object of Barbary's happiness one that includes her pain and transcribes it as her own. The song most demonstrably conveys this transformative capacity through the image of trees. There are two trees in the song. While the willow comes in the refrain, the initial image painted is of a, quote, poor soul sitting and sighing beside a sycamore tree. The sycamore tree stands out 
among nondescript malleable stones, murmuring streams, and green willow that each works solely on a rhetorical level. This tree, however, operates both metaphorically and literally. There are two unrelated versions of the sycamore, one spelled with an A and another with an O. Medieval writers who noticed the many re references to the sycamore in the Bible, such as in the famous uh, Zacchaeus story, indiscriminately apply the label to many shade-giving trees found across England, including the taller sycamore, with an A, which is an invasive species which itself was not native to Britain, a kind of botanical appropriation. While the two sound alike, the long spreading branches of the Afro-Asian sycamore fig, the one with the O, better resemble a weeping willow and provide much more shade in arid con conditions compared to its homophonic cousin far north. While the protagonist in the song may have well found a place to sit near the tall sycamore, especially if the imagined scene were set somewhere near England, she would have not found uh, much shade there. Thus, the sycamore that the song identifies could very well invoke the shading sick omor with an O found much farther south. Through Desdemona, Shakespeare's transformation and uprooting of the African sick omor to the more familiar naturalized European sick amor with an A not only whitens the natural landscape of the original folk ballad from which Shakespeare's song derives, but it also renders the natural imagery of the lyric ineffective at providing shade or communicating the melancholy of the poor soul. In other words, by placing the lamenting protagonist beside a sycamore with an A, uh, Shakespeare transforms the uniqueness of Barbary's blues into a common English ballad. Who knows what Shakespeare meant by his choice of tree? He's not an arborist. But perhaps something happened at the printing stage where, regardless of the original intent, the more common spelling with the A simply morphed into the willow song willow tree of the song. To push this a bit farther, it could, it could be part of Desdemona's appropriation to replace the foreign sycamore with one more familiar to European aesthetic tastes. Intentional or not, the replacement or the conveniently uh, homophonic overlapping of the two is what Desdemona ends up doing with the song as a whole. It collapses on itself such that it no longer matters the, that uh, Barbary sang the song but that Desdemona, the main actor in the scene and the sympathetic, sympathetic character of the play, transforms it into something emotionally familiar, universal, and timeless. Her rendition threatens to lobotomize difference and subsume it under the guise of universality. What is it about this tree that welcomes the melancholic posture of sitting and the melancholic sound of sighing while also working to heal that pain? like a hug that can make you cry and feel safe at the same time. The tree is a site of grief and relief all at once. It functions as a place of both mourning and healing that ultimately comforts Barbary and offers her a restorative place of refuge. Trees are fascinating and majestic. In a way, I suppose they can make meaning out of meaningless situations. While they seem individual, they are comprised of communities. They hold stories, remind us of a past, and are resilient enough to carry those stories into the future. They signify family and generation, networks of relation often stolen from Africans kidnapped and forcibly brought to these shores. This variation changes as, it, as, it, as much as it changes us. They invite sitting and sighing as much as they welcome celebration and dance. They can reveal as much as they conceal. And like any art, they can be used and misused for all manner of things. They bear fruit, both strange and familiar, and invite us into a kind of refreshing newness while forewarning us to pause, speak, and acknowledge before moving forward. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions here. Um, I know I was supposed to do three, I did four, sorry. Um, good morning. 
So the first one, I'll read it to you for those, uh, especially those watching. Um, the first question says, what are some of the egregious acts of appropriation in your historical, artistic, or literary texts? Uh, and what can we learn from these? The second question, can appropriation ever work for black and indigenous and people of color? What are ways, this is the third one, what are ways that you disentangle appropriation from scholarship on historical periods? And finally, what are some of the ways that you work to highlight marginalized and silenced voices in your own work? So these are some of the questions that might get us started in our discussion. And I'll take any questions that you might have as well. But this is a dialogue. As, as I said to begin with, I'm a student of the church and educators, so let's discuss. Good morning, Brother Shaw. Good morning. Haven't been to church in a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> welcome, welcome. <laughs> uh, just uh, to get us uh, started here, the, my comment is, is a very quick one, but I just wanted this to be said at the top of your, uh, at the top of the discussion. Thank you for an absolutely uh, brilliant talk and, and, and very inspired by that. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you totally just shifted my entire consciousness on Othello. And <laughs> I think like discussions like this is a start to the answer of, the la uh, of, of a couple of the, the, the final, the last two questions. Um, because you made me think of how do I highlight marginalized and silenced voices in my work as an artist? And now I'm thinking, like making notes about, okay, the next time I encounter Othello, how do I take this information and implement it into how I'm telling the story? And I think one way you can do that is um, to not, uh, I'm act, I was speak, speaking theatrically, um, is to, not limit yourself to necessarily the words on the page and do a little bit more of a deep dive as you've done in this talk, um, which will hopefully foster more ideas of how those uh, marginalized voices can, can flourish. And it, it, an example that immediately came to my mind is what if um, Barbary somehow appeared in silhouette to sing the Willow Song, or, or something, you know, something to bring out that's not necessarily written into the words or the, sta the staging or the story, but that you can add artistically um, to, to highlight things that aren't addressed or said or people that are marginalized in stories. Th that's a great point. Thank you, Raphael. So uh, it makes me think about um, the text that I was inspired by uh, in, in working through this is Toni Morrison and Rukia Troy's uh, Desdemona um, that does uh, uh, give a voice back to Barbary, right? That's the whole point of it, to um, highlight this relationship between uh, these two characters, Desdemona and, and, and Barbary. Um, and I, I think that's one place to look to see, okay, what can we uh, do with this, in a way, a kind of appropriation uh, that then highlights uh, black voices, right? Um, and then what can we take from that and then use and incorporate uh, to uh, develop more substantial and ethical versions and productions and performances of Othello uh, as, as we see them? Um, so that the Toni Morrison version isn't so distinct from the Othello, but uh, informs the way that we think about Othello going forward, for instance. Justin, that was amazing. <laughs> um, 
one thing that it did make me think about at the end was, of course, the um, apocryphal story about Shakespeare's mulberry tree. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that yeah. I thought you might yeah. be able to weave in because, right, so it was in Stratford and what did they cut, they eventually cut it down during, was it the Jubilee or something? And made furniture out of it that where they, they that they sold at at the birthplace trust. <laughs> and and Shakespeare, there's a lot of wood, like the Globe Theater and the wood that's transported across the Thames. It's like there's wood all around Shakespeare. And people have talked about the Shakespeare in a natural landscape, but what is what are these things being transformed into? And I think uh, appropriation goes both ways. It could be used for bad, but it can also just be used to transform one thing into another. But I think it, it resonated for me when, when you st started your talk sure. about saying perhaps whiteness as a system operates sadistically. It also operates sadistically with its own. Yes. Right? That yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> no. it, it, it was so brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Justin, thank you so much for an amazing talk. And I really loved your line about how you don't happen to appropriate, appropriation happens to you. And I want to extend that to the question of citational practice, right? Um, because while all of us in this room are very committed to an ethical practice of citation, there are also a lot of us in this room whose ideas have been appropriated without the similar commitment to citational practice. And I wonder if we could talk about that a little bit more. That, that's a fantastic question. Um, so uh, what are your experiences with that and how do we uh, work against these, these, this pernicious impulse that's been happening uh, of our work uh, not getting cited, not getting found in the algorithm? Uh, how do you deal with that? What are your experiences uh, uh, in, in, in dealing with this uh, wonderful question? Hi, Justin. Thank you for this brilliant talk. Um, a few things, especially thinking about disentangling appropriation on scholarship from other fields, I really feel that thinking about the Moor, thinking about Othello, thinking about Barbary, thinking about that whole geography was really, um, like the 19th century really fucked us up <laughs> because, yeah. pardon my language, um, because they constructed that as a non-black region, yes. right? So I love scholarship that is putting black back into that part of Africa. So thinking about that and the quote that you had that you unpacked for us on Barbary, I wonder if you're connecting the, the, the madness that you identify as how Shakespeare is constructing black love are you interested in going back to Othello then and sort of his love for Desdemona also as a kind of madness? Because he, I mean, obviously he has the fit, he has all these things and it's what the play seems to be doing. Right, and I think that's, um, that's what perhaps Des, the, the pit. Ah, good morning. Um, I, I think that's something that the, the parallel structure of um, uh, Barbary's story offers to Othello's and Desdemona's story that uh, there's a sense of a love gone wrong, but particularly that love being illicit to begin with and illicit love um, being illegitimated. Uh, love is, is well understood at the time to be a kind of uh, uh, sickness, right? A, a kind of melancholy, a kind of um, disorder in a kind of way. Um, and so there's something illicit about love to begin with, but there's something even more so when that love is by people who shouldn't be together in the first place. Uh, and I think, yeah, there's something there that, can, that, we, can, that we can excavate from uh, the story of Barbary that then Desdemona tries to work with, work against and work through um, to make sense of her own relationship um, and her own whiteness in relation to uh, these black characters, these black uh, texts, these, this black art that she's trying to um, appropriate. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Justin. Thank you so much. I really love that. It was a 
just a beautiful reading. Um, and I actually wondered if I could ask you um, a slightly nerdy kind of poetry question sure. about the about the passage and how it speaks to some of these other issues, which is one of the things that I noticed um, in looking at the passage as you were reading it, was that uh, one aspect of the Willow song that Desdemona also sort of does violence to um, is the refrain structure. And so I just wondered if you, I would really love to hear you just talk a little bit more about the way in which the, the specific um, kind of violence to the form or maybe sort of the, re, or, or maybe the attempt to recreate another kind of English lyric form, how, how that also um, maps on to the other, the other, um, the, the other sort of acts of, of, of silencing and, you know, and, and kind of writing Barbary out of the, uh, writing her sort of effective narrative out of the story. Right, that's a great question. Um, I actually explore a lot of that in my larger dissertation chapter uh, from which this comes. And uh, you're right, and there's something that Desdemona does, Desdemona and Amelia, do to the uh, poetic structure of this folk ballad um, that becomes Barbary's song, uh, that then becomes um, deconstructed in a kind of way through uh, the white voices of Amelia and Desdemona in a, in a similar way that uh, Othello's mother's handkerchief becomes deconstructed through uh, Iago and Amelia and Cassio and Bianca um, and, 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 and untangled uh, uh, through those different um, exchanges. And so, yeah, in, in the poetic structure here, yeah, it, it, I think you're right. It does um, break apart the song, um, and in a kind of way, if we go back to the, the idea of the trees and the wood, kind of breaks apart these kinds of, uh, this, this natural landscape that um, may have been a site of healing, right, uh, for its original or earlier curator, uh, that now becomes this, this fragmented um, site that doesn't quite offer the same kind of benefits to Amelia and Desdemona, who perhaps don't understand uh, its significance, uh, what it meant to Barbary, what it meant to uh, the community perhaps Barbary was only a part of, but also um, recognized within the song itself. So uh, yeah, if you look at the, the folk ballad, there is as, um, a very strict kind of uh, poetic structure there, and Desdemona seems to be picking and choosing right, what she wants from it and leaving behind what she doesn't think she needs. And I, I think that's what happens a lot in scholarship, right? We take what we want and then leave behind what we don't need um, and don't even cite where, when and where, where it comes from. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Justin. Thank you so much um, for this wonderful talk. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, one thing that really struck me now that I'm just reading this, um, and I never never thought about this before, until I started like thinking about the that line, the fresh dreams ran by her and murmured her moans. That kind of like idea that she is not just with with the landscape, but like also part of the landscape, and the landscape's also like uh, reflecting her own affect. Um, which to me is like such a stark contrast to something like As You Like It when you have the Duke's relationship with um, nature. It's, it's a, like a white colonial relationship to nature, right? And so there's a really interesting like dynamic at play with her, uh, the kind of uh, intersections between critical race theory and like ecofeminism and thinking about women, particularly women of color's relationship to nature, um, the way the, they, they get constructed as part of nature, but also um, thinking about indigeneity as well. Um, do you think about that in terms of like the effective structure? Because both of both texts, like As You Like It and the scene, uh, scene two, right? Uh, uh, act two, scene two, I think it is, with like the Duke mm -hmm. going into the woods and he sees the, the nature as his counsel Council, right, um, rather than being a part of him or being like a symbiotic relationship. Um, do you see that kind of structure and does that like influence like, your kind of affective reading of Barbary's words? Right, right thank you. Um, so it makes me think uh, as we're talking about um, that relationship between women of color and the land that has also been used to denigrate women of color, right? Um, uh, in, in so many ways that the land and its organic nature uh, and its dirtiness and its um, unruliness, right, is connected to uh, blackness and femininity in a way that 
that, uh, that denigrates women of color and has, has done so in literature for, for centuries. Um, and that, that work you see a lot more in modern critical race studies um, and, and black studies and, and indigenous studies and so forth. Um, but there's also something about um, the organic but also communal and also the life-giving uh, in a very positive way connection to the land to nature that's in, in, in there. And I think there's a, a discrepancy between what Desdemona thinks that she's doing with this text and what she thinks she needs this text for, um, as opposed to perhaps what Barbary um, utilized it and, and embodied this, this, uh, this text to, uh, in, in, for her own means. Um, so anyway, I, I, think, I think you're right. I think you're on to something there, that there's, there's something going on with the way Desdemona interprets this relationship to the land as something that's uh, utilitarian, um, that's different than perhaps what uh, Desdemona, I mean, excuse me, Barbary uh, uh, embodied with this different kind of life-giving um, uh, healing aspect uh, that, that connected people in, in, in very um, meaningful ways. And I think there's a disconnect between those two perspectives. So that's a great point. Hi there, Justin. Um, hey. First of all, excellent talk. Um, I was just very, I was just like listening to the differences between Sitka more and Sitgo more. I was just drawn to etymology. Um, so at first hearing more and hearing how more obviously invoking blackness and all of the connections between that. Uh, Miriam Gallerita and I have sort of been brainstorming about the etymology of Sikko and how it sort of ties into even Sikorax yes. from The Tempest. Yeah. And um, we were actually trying to research just now if she actually lived in a tree or I believe that it's like she died in a pine or something like that. Mm. So it's like it's very interconnected, all of this sort of like etym etymological sort of, um, you know, woven structures that Shakespeare's sort of weaving in. Did you come up with anything for Sikko or Sika? Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested to know when you come up, that's, that's really, really interesting, and to pick up with that connection to the Tempest, that's, that's really, really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for a very inspiring talk. Um, it's just a general, you know, uh, uh, comment within the general context when you spoke about um, uh, the blues and we spoke about, you, you know, what came to mind is uh, Harvard professor Henry Lewis Gates Jr.'s book, The Signifying Monkey. And, um, you know, the argument that the Africans who were forced to be brought to America did not come along. They brought their culture with them. Mm. And he spoke about the different aspects of music. And as we have the, you know, the blues and the spirituals and the jazz, now uniquely African-American musical yeah. aspects. And um, what brought, you know, was brought to mind as well was uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. And um, you know, just a general comment of yesterday when we were talking about how do we deconstruct those medieval racist uh, you know, appropriations. These are some of the aspects that we can use to deconstruct that. Yeah. Race, be for race. And thank you, Ayanna Thompson, very much for this conference and symposium. Now, Brother Shaw, <laughs> I, uh, you've messed me up this morning. And you, you know, you've messed me up because I have taken, I've been thinking about your third or fourth question down, whether and how appropriation can work for black and indigenous people of color. And the things that come to mind make me take off my medievalist hat and put on my 20th century musical historian hat which is also inspired by the fact that you just gave us a beautiful song. So thank you for that. Um, what strikes me is that if one can answer this question, the only answer is with is yes, with extraordinary institutional and cultural support. And what I mean by that, I'll bring up an example. This is the 20th century musical historian example. One of the most highly praised popular songs of the late 20th century is, of course, Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You. Right. 
which pretty much everybody thinks of as Whitney Houston's. Mm -hmm. And everyone thinks of as a rhythm and blues, a popular rhythm and blues, but still rhythm and blues song. Now, of course, it is not, I mean, she made it her song, but it's not her song. That's right. Written by Dolly Parton as a country song mm. some 20 years prior, but very rarely brought up as part of Parton's oeuvre. Right. Now, the only way that that becomes associated so closely with Whitney Houston and black music is of course the extraordinary amount of money and the extraordinary amount of cultural capital built around that song and that artist. Now of course there are complications to this and the fact being that country music itself is an appropriation, right? Something grown of the rural blues as is all, Af all American roots music. Mm -hmm. so I almost said African roots music. <laughs> But that said, I think the point stands that with extraordinary institutional support, perhaps appropriation can work for black and indigenous people of color. Hence race before race, absolutely. Um, but now for race before race, we need Arista Records money. <laughs> So, you know, I, I don't know if you want to say any more in reaction to, uh, to the way I'm thinking about appropriation possibly working on behalf of black and indigenous people of color, but those are my thoughts for the moment. And, and when you say institutional support, could you break that down? What do you, what do you mean by that? Because I think, I think you and I both know what you mean. What, what do you mean by institutional support? Extraordinary institutional support, I think you say. What do you, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean several things. I mean money, but also why it's a lot of money, a lot of money. <laughs> but also widespread popularity and interest, right? So, you know, something that, uh, that elevates to the level of hegemony yeah. as, you know, the popular music, American popular music industry does globally. Um, and of course, that's not, uh, that's not something that's easily created and certainly not quickly created. But it is something that is created and is constructed strategically. You know, I'm, I'm thinking too about, when you mentioned institutional support, um, uh, the recent uh, magnificent call to action by Kim Hall, Aina Thompson, and Kim Coles, uh, call to early modern scholars to, uh, in the field, in our teaching, in our scholarship, but also in mentoring, um, to, uh, look back and, and bring people behind us, uh, to look in, and, and encourage people to work in these fields, um, uh, to not run away to uh, later periods uh, because they fear, uh, sometimes rightly so, um, the toxicity of pre-modern studies. But we, in our roles as mentors, as instructors, as advisors and so forth, um, uh, should that, I think that's a part of institutional support in growing this thing so that we become uh, the norm. This becomes the, the standard. Uh, we're not always fighting against the dominant, uh, whatever that is, dominant uh, wave of scholarship. And so I, I really encourage people to look at that. It's called Black Shakespeareans, a call to, to, to action. Um, and and uh, it does really wonderful work in outlining uh, what we need to do in our fields to, to really uh, engage with not just the work, but the people doing the work um, going forward. All right, we've got one last question. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Justin, for this uh, fabulous talk. I, I hear this is the last question, it has to be short, so <laughs> it's more, you know, a general um, direction in which I would love for us all to uh, keep 
thinking, especially as this is a chapter for you, um, but I kept thinking uh, during your talk about the fact that this, the Willow Song, is actually based upon an English ballad, right? Mm -hmm. That circulated in England, right. that spectators would know, and in the original, uh, it's actually sung by a man, which is interesting mm -hmm. because this mm -hmm. uh, widening of the ballad actually starts with a regendering of the ballad. So there are several dynamics of appropriation um, yes. going on that would have inflected the audience's um, response to this moment. And then you have, obviously, oh, yes, and, the, and I wanted to point out, uh, going back to the question of etymology, could also be a pun, right? The sycamore. Like That's right. Um, That's right. But, uh, and, and then finally, at the end of the play, you have Emilia, who's appropriating the song. Right, so you have several moments of appropriation, reappropriation, mm -hmm. and I'm just, you know, wondering whether uh, placing that beautiful uh, argument you, you have made in the context of those larger dynamics might might help, you know, even uh, enrich it even further. But this yeah. might be more of a comment than a question. <laughs> yeah, no, and I'll just say that Amelia, as, since you brought that up, Amelia is the last person to actually recite the song at the end of the play when when she dies. Um, and so there's something that happens to the, this, this text. Uh, even further, going, uh, you mentioned the English ballad that transforms in Desdemona's hands, that then transforms again uh, through Amelia at the end of her narrative. Um, that last until until we get it. So whose song is it? That's what I said. I think appropriation raises questions about ownership, about um, propriety, about provenance uh, that we all should be grappling with um, because it, it transforms both the text itself, but also transforms um, those who engage with the text too. It should. It should transform those of us who engage with those texts. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs>